Rayford um, at the service, um, at the service of traveling there um, for their, they're having a service there and I'm going to be the speaker, praise team and the musicians will um, travel along with us um, to be there all they can and will and would like to follow us just getting in the motorcade, amen, as we travel there to be a blessing to, amen, that ministry. Also on the fourth Sunday is Women's Day. Women, um, I don't know if um, Sister Lisa uh, mentioned uh, everyone, all of the women are wearing white that day. Amen. So you would like to join in. Please come out. Amen. There's going to be something to eat afterwards. Amen. Not a, not a hoagie. Not a hoagie or, or a salad. Amen. Some some food. Amen. Amen. So please, man, please, sir, come out. Be a part. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise. Amen. Amen. I'm a musician. Amen. Brother Willis joined us last week. Amen. But Brother Malik has joined us today. Amen. On the drums. Amen. We give God praise. Amen. Today we love him. Amen. We appreciate who they are and what they are. Amen to us. But nevertheless, it's word time Amen. in the sanctuary. Somebody say it's word time. It's word time. I don't know about y'all, but I need a word from the Lord. Amen. Amen. I need a word from the Lord. Amen. The praise team is coming one more time. Amen. I know they've been singing, y'all. Amen. I know they've been singing to y'all. Amen. They sound good, don't they? Amen. Amen. But they're going to sing this next song. Amen. Amen. And share with us. Anybody know Jesus will? I said, anybody know Jesus will? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I want y'all to be a part of this song. And can y'all do that for me? Yeah. Amen. So you got to stand up, get a little groove with it, get a little nod with it. I need everybody to be a part. Amen. Amen. Oh, I mean. 
Bless your word as it is preached this day. 
We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name, someone shout amen. Come on, put those hands together one more time. Grab your Bibles really quickly. Let's go to the word of the Lord. Amen. We're going to the book of Acts chapter 1. Going to the book of Acts chapter 1. It feels right churchy in here, don't it, y'all? Yes. Amen. Acts chapter 1. We're going to begin reading, amen, with verse number 12. There's a word i got to share with y'all. It's bubbling in my heart, y'all. Amen. Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. When you have it, you can say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, all that can and will please stand in reverence to the word of the Lord. The Bible reads like this from the King James Version. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room. Somebody say an upper room. Oh. Where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon, Zelotus and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and, the, and Mary the mother of Jesus. And with his brethren, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number uh -huh, of names together were about an hundred and twenty. The number of names together were about an hundred and twenty and hundred and twenty and hundred and twenty. Look at your neighbor and say neighbor. neighbor. Are, you Are you in, in the, 120? the 120? Look at somebody else. Look at somebody else and say neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. oh neighbor. I got one question. Oh, Are you, Are you in, in the 120? Somebody give God praise. of the Lord are you in the 120 y'all gonna walk with me today amen. Amen. amen so many so many times we hear of pastors and ministers and preachers alike amen preach and minister about the upper room experience uh, the upper room experience is found in the book of Acts around the second chapter. We hear these preachers make mention when they pray or when they preach or even uh, after Easter, 40 days after Easter, amen, we, we make, amen, connections with the scriptural reference of Pentecost or the day of Pentecost. Uh, these two phrases, these two phrases, the day of Pentecost and the upper room experience speak about the same event. They are speaking about the same occurrence for it was the day of Pentecost that occurred or took place, amen, in a space called the upper room. Mm -hmm. Pentecost happened in uh, the upper room. And so today I think, I think that this is a good time for us to take a commercial break and take a closer look um, at the phrase called the upper room. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. We must, we must determine where was the upper room and what was the upper room. Y'all gonna walk to me today? Yeah, history tells tells us that the upper room was not found in just anybody's house. Come on, somebody say amen. Yeah, for this spacious upper room or an upper chamber as it is referred to 
you in scripture many times it typically was only in the temple mm -hmm. yeah the upper room was in a place of worship mm -hmm. and outside of that it was in the temple but it was also in the rich man's house talk to me yeah you had to either be in the church to see the upper room or you had to be around people that had a little bit of money somebody say amen there in the book of Jeremiah, it makes reference to the upper room as something that only the rich could possess. Amen. And so outside of that, amen, it was either in the temple or it was in the upper room. I'm not lost. I'm going somewhere. Now, outside of this, we have another clue as to what the upper room was. When David, over in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, he gives Solomon a pattern. He gives him a blueprint. And on this blueprint, he has, amen, the pattern of a port, the pattern of a house, the pattern of treasures, and he also had the pattern of the upper room. Somebody say amen. Amen. And so David, David, amen, he gives Solomon a pattern or a blueprint of the upper room. He tells him how the upper room should look. He tells him how the upper room should be designed. He tells him how the upper room should be structured. He tells them how the upper room, amen, should be put in place. He tells them what should be in the upper room and what should not be in the upper room. Mm -hmm. So the question must be asked to David, David, why would you put things in an upper room just because? Well, in this case, if you were to read the 28th chapter of First Chronicles, you would find out that one of the furnishings that was in this upper room was something called the mercy seat. <laughs> And the mercy seat was something that God would allow his spirit to descend and ascend upon the mercy seat. So in this regard, the upper room, because it had the mercy seat, it was a place where God was going to dwell. God, I wish I had a church to help me here. It was a place where God's presence uh -huh, was going to abide. Yeah, it was a place where God was going to sit down and have his way. Look at your neighbor and say it was a place where God dwelt. It was a place where God dwelled. And so understanding this, can I preach it like I feel it today? So understanding this, it helps me to understand when we move in Acts chapter 9. And the Bible said that there was a woman by the name of Tabitha, who was also called Dorcas. There was a particular woman. This particular woman, the Bible said that she made garments for all of the people in the land. She took care of everybody. She fed folk that didn't have food to eat. She clothed the naked. But the Bible said one day that Dorcas got sick and she died. But catch this. When Dorcas died, they did not call the funeral home. They did not call the more. They did not call those responsible to prepare her body. But the Bible said they took her to the upper room. I wish I had a church to help me here. The Bible said that they took her to an upper room and they laid her on a bed and stretched her out. Can I talk like I feel it today? And so the Bible said that when they laid her on the bed, they called for Peter. And the Bible said that Dorcas was laying this way, but when Peter got there, he prayed in a different direction than what she was laying down. He did not decide to look at her, nor did he decide to touch her, but he decided to pray in an opposite direction. And the Bible said as he prayed, something turned him around. God, 
I wish I had a praying church there. Amen. The Bible says that something turned her around, but she was in the upper room. So we're not crazy and we're not questioning what it was that turned her around because we understand that the upper room was a place where God dwelled. So it wasn't something that turned him around, but it was the spirit of Almighty God that turned him around and he lifted her by the hand. Amen. And the Bible says that she arose. So the upper room was a place where God dwelled, but it was also a place for miracle signs and wonders. Somebody say the upper room was a place where God dwelled, but it was also a place where miracle signs and wonders happened. Glory God, let's go a little deeper. So as we begin to search the scriptures again, we find that Jesus over in the gospel according to Mark. Glory to God, he begins to tell the disciples. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, where shall we prepare the Passover feast? Jesus said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into the next city. Glory to God. And there you will find a man carrying a pitcher of water. He said, whatsoever house he go in, I want you to follow him. And when you get into the house, I want you to ask him, the master has need to have the Passover. Where can we make ready for our master? And the Bible said that the man that was taking him, glory to God, into the house, he did not carry them in the living room. Did not carry them in the kitchen, but the Bible said he took them to an upper room. Can I get a witness there? And so the Bible says that when they got there, hold on Josh, just give me a few more minutes. Glory to God, when he takes them to the upper room, it is there that they make the Passover feast. So the upper room was a place where God dwelt. It was a place for, for miracle signs and wonders. Now it was a place for the Passover. Come on somebody say amen. Let's go a little deeper. Now we find in Acts chapter 20. Here comes the Apostle Paul standing up in a room. The Bible said they had many lights or lamps. And as we continue to read and as he continues to proclaim the word, we find out that he was preaching in an upper room. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The upper room was a place where God dwelled. It was a place for miracle signs and wonders. It was a place for the Passover. And now it was a place for the proclamation of God's word. Pastor, what are you saying? What I'm trying to get you to see mm -hmm, is that when you come to rivers of life, you cannot come to rivers of life thinking rivers of life is just a building. You have to come thinking this is your upper room. I feel like preaching here. You got to think of this place as a place where God dwells. You got to think of this place as a place where I'm coming to meet my God. I'm not coming here to spectate. I'm not coming here to dictate. I'm not coming to look at you. Your eyebrows look good. Your face is beat and your suit is nice. But I came to feel the presence of the Lord. In this house to feel God Almighty. And if you come for any other reasons, you have my permission to be excused. But this is the house of God. This is a place where we feel God's presence. This is the place we don't come to look at you. We come to feel God's presence. We come to get in God's face. We come to see bodies be healed. We come to see the lame walk. We come to see the dead. Dumb talk. Look at your neighbor say, This is God's house. And so the Bible declares that the upper room was a place where God dwelt. Then it was a place for miracles. It was a place for the Passover. And it was a place for the proclamation of God's word. But none of these things speak to us about what 
the disciples were doing in the upper room. None of this tells us why they were there. None of this tells us why they were doing what they were doing. It is not until we look at Luke's gospel that we understand why they were there. In Luke 24 verse 49, the Bible said that Jesus looked at the disciples and he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father. In other words, I'm getting ready to leave you. I'm getting ready to go back to my daddy, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but instead I'm going to leave you somebody called the Holy Ghost. He said, but in order for you to get the Holy Ghost, you got to get down to Jerusalem. And when you get to Jerusalem, I want you to tarry there. Wait on it. Don't get in a hurry. Wait on it. Don't get in a rush. Wait on it. See, that's the problem with the church today. We don't get the full power of God because we're not willing to wait on God. But I hear Isaiah this afternoon and say, faith and wait upon the Lord shall renew. I wish I had a praying church there. And so the Bible says, glory to God that he get there. So we understand now that they were in the upper room because God told them to get to the upper room. I got about three minutes and I'm getting out of here. Glory to God, they say to him, they say, you have taken us and you told us to go to the upper room. And so they get to the upper room. But catch this. Jesus only told them to wait in the upper room. Jesus only told them to sit in the upper room. He didn't tell them to do anything else but wait on the promise. He told them, don't you go anywhere until you be in do with power for He said, Don't leave until you feel God's power. Don't leave until you feel God's anointing. Don't leave until you feel the strength of God. And so God tells them that I want you to just stay there. But as we read the story, we find out that they just weren't staying there. But they were in the upper room. And they were on one call. They had one mind. They had one heart. They had one spirit. And the Bible declares that they were praying and fasting wait a minute Jesus you didn't tell them to pray you didn't tell them to fast you didn't tell them to touch and agree you didn't tell them to do that no Jesus said I did not tell them to pray I did not tell them to fast I did not tell them to get on one accord but they remember down in the garden when I told them that something only come by fasting and by praying. I did not tell them to get on their knees. I did not tell them to link hand in hand. I did not tell them to touch and agree. But they remember down in the garden when I said, wherever two or three are gathered together, only anyone thing. I be in the midst. I gotta get out of here. But they began to fast. They began to pray. They began to get over the court. They had one mind. They had one heart. They had one spirit. And the Bible said that suddenly a sound from heaven, like as a rushing mighty wind, it came in. That cloven tongue, light as a fire, it came in and I don't got time to deal with it, but touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, every now and then, I need the Holy Ghost to sit on me, sit on me. Thank <laughs> you.
doesn't show up. And I want to let you know that there are some of the 380 that come to church every Sunday. They don't come looking for anything. They don't come expecting anything. They come to church like it's a yearly checkup. Like they just come to church to fulfill a weekly obligation. But I made up in my mind. I'm not dressing myself up just to dress myself up. Not putting on all these hot clothes just to put on hot clothes. Not perming your hair just to perm your hair. Not putting on your heels just to put on heels. But when I come into the house, there because I'm sending the promise there. He said, I'm not sending it to Samaria. I'm sending it to Jerusalem. He said, because I'm sending it to Jerusalem because once it hits Jerusalem, I want you to take it to Samaria. I want you to take it to the uttermost part of the world. He said, I'm just going to send it to Jerusalem because I'm going to trust you to do the rest. God says, can I trust you to take it I said before I can trust you to take it I got to first trust you to be in the 120 you can't take bread if you don't have bread Amen. God said you can't take my spirit if you don't already have my spirit But to get it, you got to be a part of the 120. I hear the Lord say there are so many 380s in the church. But God said, where is the 120? The people that say, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what, I'm going to be with the 120. Today I want to know, are you a part of the 120? Are you, or are you just moseying along? Are you just going day by day through the motions? Or are you a part of the 120? The doors of the church are open. Maybe there's one today that says, Pastor, I'm a 380. But I want to be a part of the 120. And I want to give my heart to the Lord. I want to be saved. If that's you, would you come? Would you come? Would you would you would you meet me here? Would you give your life to the Lord? Become a part of the 120. You may say, I'm, I'm, I'm. is there one? You may say, I'm already a part. I already joined the 120, but I, I, I left the 120 and I went to the 380. I stepped out of the ark of safety. Well, the good thing about God is if you confess your fault, promise to be faithful 
and just. He promised that he would cleanse you, hallelujah, from all unrighteousness. Is there one today that said, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord? Did you come? Let's call you. They say, I'm, I'm, we've already done that, but I want to, I want to plant myself. I need a church and I want to plant myself if you want to join the river of life come 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 be a part of our family will there be one if not something is impressed upon my spirit I want us all to come to the altar Everybody, everybody that needs special prayer, needs God to do something special for them. Come, we're going to believe God. We're going to trust God. Continue to mold us and shape us. 
Continue to bless the rivers of life ministry. Expand, enlarge our territory. In the name of Jesus. We trust your plan. We're walking out your will. In the name of Jesus. Deliver us, oh God. From sinful thoughts, sinful capacity, sinful duty. Deliver us. Make us like you. Give us a heart like thine. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you praise in advance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you in advance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For all that you do, all that you're going to do. In the name of Jesus. In the church said, Amen. Come on, put those hands together. Put those hands together. If there's anybody, anybody that needs special prayer, would like me just to do it. Touch and agree with you. Touch and agree with you. Touch and agree with you. In the name of Jesus, whenever she stands in need of God, we count it done. We claim the victory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We believe it and it is so. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to mention that in your mother. In the name of Jesus, we call out any burden in the name of Jesus.